Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. This is section 3.2, the graphs of functions. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at how do we determine if something is a function just from its graph. And one of the tests that we can do is called the vertical line test. Essentially what, what we define a function as is that each x corresponds to only one y. That is the definition of a function. So what that means is x doesn't repeat. So let's take a look at this function here. We're going to determine if this function is, or if this graph is in fact a function. We're going to use a vertical line test, which is essentially we take a vertical line and we see how many times it intersects the graph. Well, if I put it here, it only intersects the green part of my illustration here once, or here it only intersects it once, or here it only intersects it once. And if I infinitely move it a little at a time, it's only going to intersect this one time. So for each x, it corresponds to one y. So this side of the graph and this side of the graph, we could see, yes, it passes the vertical line test. For each x, it only corresponds to one value of y. So this is, in fact, a function. Well, let's use the vertical line test to determine if this is a function. Now, we recognize this as a circle, and we just uh, explored circles in chapter 2. Let's see, if I put a vertical line anywhere on this graph, we see that it intersects it in more than one place. So this is not a function, because x repeats. x is this value and this value, or x is this value and this value. Two values of y for one value of x, so the x is repeating. x is this negative value of y or this positive value of y. If we look at this one here, well, this is a line. And if we use the vertical line test, we see, yes, this is a function because my vertical line will only intersect it once no matter where I put it. This graph here, if we want to determine if it's a function, we can look at a vertical line test and say, yep, it only intersects it once for each value of x. So it is truly a function. Now, what if we're asked to find the domain and range of a function? Well, recall that domain are the possible input values of x. So if we want to look at this function and say, well, what are the possible values of x? On the negative side of the graph, well, we have values of x, because this continues on to negative infinity. We have a value of x up until we get to the y-axis. Notice it doesn't cross the y-axis, so there is no y-intercept, which means x is not equal to 0. As we move to the right, we see, OK, we have a value of x as we move to the right. So if we're going to write the domain using interval notation, the only value that's not on our graph is when x is 0. So we have values of x that go all the way to negative infinity, because that's where this arrow points, up to 0, but not including 0, because there is no y-intercept. This as it goes up, it just gets infinitely closer to the y-axis, but never touches it. And union from 0, because 0 is not included, to positive infinity. And we can see that this goes on for infinity. That's what the arrow indicates. Well, what about the range? What do we know about the range? Well, I see that this line never goes through the x-axis, but I have values above. This line never goes through the x-axis, but I have values below. So we can see there's no x-intercept, which tells me that this graph, its range, is every value except for y. So from negative infinity to 0, union 0 to infinity. So all the way down here, the y values are negative. This arrow points down to negative infinity. As we come up, it approaches the x-axis but doesn't cross. Here, it approaches the x-axis and goes up to positive infinity. So 0 is the only excluded value. So we have the domain and range of this function. And we know it is a function because it passed the vertical line test. Well, we're not going to worry about domain or range on here. This isn't a function, so maybe that's our stipulation in order to find domain and range. Maybe we're just going to look at uh, graphs that are functions. If we look at this, we know it's a linear equation because we see the straight line. And we know this continues on to negative infinity to the right and down. And it continues on to positive infinity, or to the right and left, excuse me, and up. 
So our domain, our x values, our possible inputs, are all real values, because it continues on to negative infinity to the left, positive infinity to the right. Our range, well, this arrow points down, and it continues to go down forever. So our range is all real numbers. If we're going to write this in interval notation, we're going to have negative infinity to infinity, negative infinity to positive infinity. So both our domain and range are all real numbers. And in interval notation, negative infinity to positive infinity. If we look at this, well, this was a function, but it's only a segment of a function. And uh, if we're going to determine the domain, well, let's look at the x values. Domain is always x values. It's at 0, and it looks like it includes 0. So I'm going to use a bracket, 0. And it continues on. There are x values all the way up to 2 pi. And this graph is uh, denoted as pi. So I'm going to write 2 pi. And it looks like it includes that point as well. So I use the bracket to show that the endpoints are included. When we look at the range, however, the lowest value in y would be this right here, this negative 2. And the highest value would be positive 2. So our range goes from negative 2 to positive 2. And I'm going to assume that it includes those values. And we always write our intervals from the smallest to the greatest. So negative 2 to 2 would be the range, the lowest value in y to the highest value in y. Range is always our y values. What are our outputs? Domain is our x values. What is our input? All right, we're going to move the board here. And we're going to recall how we deal with function notation. If we look at this, can we determine if it's a function? Well, if we use the vertical line test, we can see it only intersects the graph in one spot, no matter where I put my vertical line. So is it a function? Yes, it is. What's the domain of this function? Well, if I look over here, this arrow continues. And it looks like it's going a little bit to the left. So we want to say, OK, it's going to continue on to the left forever. So it's negative infinity. And this side of the graph, we see it's continuing on in that direction. The arrow indicates that to positive infinity. So my domain is all real numbers, again, from negative infinity to positive infinity. But what about the range? The range, we've got to look, well, what's the lowest value? This isn't going down to negative infinity. And we see, oh, there is a point here. This appears to be the lowest point. So I can say, OK, well, it's negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 would bring me to that point. So my range is negative 3 to what value? Well, and the reason why I included negative 3 is because this point here is on the graph, so it does include that. But we see this goes off in an upward direction on both sides of the graph. So it continues upwards for infinity. And remember, parentheses for your infinities. Now we're asked to find any x-intercepts. Well, x-intercepts is where the y value is 0. So I can see there's an x-intercept here, 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 and here. There's actually four x-intercepts for this particular graph. So we're just going to write them out. I have an x value of negative 5 when y is 0. That's this one right here. An x value of negative 3 when y is 0, an x value of 0 when y is 0, and an x value of 3 when y is 0. Now we need to ask, what is the y-intercept? Well, where is the x value 0? Well, that would be the y-axis. And we see, hey, it looks like it goes through the origin there. So when x is 0, y is 0. And if we notice the origin is in both, well, that's the only place where the two axes cross. So we could, that's the only time we'd have uh, a single intercept for both x and y is at that origin. Now we're asked to find f of negative 4. And that's why I had uh, said that this is going to be a review of function notation. This says, what is the value of the function when x is negative 4? Well, if I go to negative 4, I have this point right here, which looks to be negative 1. So f of negative 4 equals negative 1. 
find f of 1. Well, when x is 1, we lo it looks like this is our point right here. We can see, oh, that looks like negative 1 as well. So we actually shared some points there, but that's OK. This x value corresponded to 1y. This different x value corresponded to 1y. It is still a function. Using function notation, this says find the missing coordinate. Well, the, our x value is missing, and we're given this value in function notation. Well, it's not a trick question. It's essentially telling me what x is there. That's the nice thing about function notation. What is the x value? Well, it's what's in those parentheses there. Now, and we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But find the missing coordinate when you're given the x value. Well, I can go to here, and I could write f of 3, but we can actually find what that value is. When uh, x is 3, this value here is negative 3. Or f of positive 3 results in negative 3. That's how function notation works. Now let's look at this here. It says, is f of negative 4 positive or negative? Well, let's. We've already found f of negative 4, and we found it to be negative 1, so we know that it's negative. But let's look at the graph. What if we're just using the function notation with the graph here? f of negative 4, well, here's negative 4 in my x value, and we're below the x-axis, so we know that it's a negative value. It doesn't necessarily have to be a value. It's just positive or negative. Well, it's below the x-axis. That means it's negative. Anything above would be positive. K here says, what number or numbers of x is f of x equal to positive 1? Well, f of x is our y value. It's saying, when is y equal to 1? Well, if I look at this, this is where y equals 1. Well, what are the x values? We have this value here, so it's going to be uh, positive 4, negative 1, and uh, some value over here, we won't worry about that one. But there is another value. So what numbers of x? We had, what did we say, negative 1 and positive 4. So those two values, there's another one, but it's kind of off the graph there. So we won't worry about it. All right, L asks us, x equals 2 intersects the graph how many times? Well, we could refer to the graph and find that. But x equals 2, we're asking, asking about intersects. x equals 2 is a vertical line. We know that vertical lines only intersect functions one time, and we've already determined that this was a function. So intuitively, we should know that it should only intersect one time. All right, so let's move this out of the way and take a little bit more time to interpret graphs. Well, what if we're not given the graph? What if we're given a function? And how do I know it's a function? Well, it has to be a function because it's written in function notation. If it's not a function, we can't write it in this notation. So the first thing we want to do is find the domain. And if we recall from the previous section, we talked about domain restrictions. Are there any radicals of even index? Are there any x's in denominators? In this case, I can see there isn't any of those restrictions. So the domain is all real numbers negative infinity to positive infinity. It asks, is negative 1, 2 this coordinate, this point, on the graph? Well, we can find that out simply by plugging it in. Let's find f of negative 1. If I plug in negative 1, negative 1 squared is a positive 1, because when we square a negative, we get a positive. So positive 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. Negative 1 times 5 is a negative 5. Negative 3 and negative 5 is negative 8. So when we plug in negative 1, we get out negative 8. That is not what this coordinate says. So is this point on the graph? No, it is not. If x equals negative 2, what is f of x? Well, let's use that and say we're given the x value. We can find the y value simply by evaluating the function for this value of x. So I'm going to find f of negative 2. And when I put negative 2 in here and square it, I get 4. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. I'll just write that up there. 
And then negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. Negative 12 and negative 10 is negative 22. So we can see that even if we had the graph of the function, and maybe our coordinates only go from negative 10 to positive 10, this value wouldn't be visible, but we can find it by evaluating the function. Now, if f of x equals negative 2, what is the x value? Well, essentially what this says is to plug or set the equation, the entire equation f of x, equal to negative 2. So let's do that over here. We're saying negative 2, our f of x value, so I'm just replacing this because f of x is negative 2, equals this equation or this function. So now it's a quadratic. I can set it equal to 0. simply by adding 2 to both sides. Now, I could solve this using quadratic methods. And for this, uh, if you're following along with the notes, it says you can use your calculator. But I believe that a calculator is not necessary for this one because it does factor. And I'm going to just review one of the methods of factoring called the AC method factor by grouping. Since this is a quadratic, A times C will give me a factor, or a product, excuse me, of negative 6. Are there factors of negative 6 that sum to a positive 5? Well, I know there are. Positive 6 times negative 1 is, in fact, a positive 5 when I sum them together. So these two factors I can use to split up the middle term. So let me just get this out of the way here. I'm going to split up the middle term to negative 6x and positive x. So I didn't change its value. And the reason why this method of factoring is, oh, I got my signs wrong. Positive 6x, negative x gives me a positive 5x. <clears throat> we call this the AC method factor by grouping because we use A and C to find the factors so that we can write this as a four-term polynomial. And the way we factor four-term term polynomials is simply by grouping. And that's why it's called AC method factor by grouping. So now I can factor out a negative 3 and an x, which leaves me with x minus 2. I can factor a negative out of here, because I want to see something similar to this. Just factor out a negative 1, and I get x minus 2. So we can see, hey, we have that common factor. So let's just factor out that common factor, and it leaves me with negative 3x minus 1. Now, keep in mind that it was set equal to 0, so it's still equal to 0. And now I can just use the zero value theorem, which means I didn't need my calculator. So x can be a positive 2, because that makes this 0 times anything is 0. And if we set this equal to 0, we're going to get a negative 1 third. Negative 1 third times negative 3 is a positive 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So we found these values. So if we go back to the question, if f of x equals negative 2, what is x? Well, the reason why I had two coordinate uh, here is because when x is 2, f of x is negative 2. So that's one of them. Well, we also found that when x is negative 1 third, our function's value is also negative 2. So it was long and tedious. And we reviewed a good method of factoring to come up with this answer, but you could have also used your calculator or quadratic methods. Maybe you wanted to use uh, the quadratic formula, whatever. Uh, let's look at finding the x-intercept of this function. Well, to find the x-intercept, we set the equation equal to 0. Again, let's go over to here. Negative 3x squared plus 5x equals 0. Now, I could solve this using quadratic methods, but again, this factor is real nice. I can factor out an x, and that leaves me with negative 3x plus 5 equal to 0. So I can say, oh, OK, now I can just use the 0 value theorem. This value of x, if it is 0, 0 times anything is 0. If I set this equal to 0, I get a positive 5 thirds. Now, if I plug that into my calculator or something like that, I'd end up getting a decimal that repeats. And uh, I like fractions. They're a little cleaner and no rounding necessary. So the x-intercepts 
0, 0, that tells me this passes through the origin. And 5 thirds when y was 0. We found the x-intercepts by setting the function equal to 0, our y value. To find the y-intercept, well, we set, x, we set x equal to 0. And if we plug 0 into this, 0 times anything is 0. 0 times anything is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. Well, again, we see that shared intercept, that origin. So we've answered all these questions. We should be able to assess functions using function notation, even without a graph. So now I have your quiz. I'll just pull this in here. Oh, wrong side. Sorry about that. Here we go. Here's your quiz, something to try on your own. Here we have the function f of x equals 1 over x minus 2 plus 1. Now you're going to answer the same set of questions as you did in the previous example. Find the domain. Determine if this point is on the graph. If x is 7, find the value of the function. If the value of the function is 2, what is the input value? Find any x-intercepts and any y-intercepts. So be careful with this one, because notice where you see that x. And notice that there's a little bit more to it. So be careful when you work it out. Show your work, and you'll be all set. This has been section 3.2. Thank you for watching.